This video uses OpenPy Excel to create a customized dark mode for your Excel reports. Unfortunately, there isn't a way to just flip a switch and make the content of the Excel sheet automatically conform to a pre-made dark mode, but this demonstration will show you how to make a single script that you can run to customize your Excel reports to make them much more viewer-friendly on the eyes. This demonstration will work best for Excel reports that are in their final form, as it does require reading the content and style of what is currently on the worksheet. Here is my testing workbook. It contains two tabs, one called regular, one called dark. The regular sheet is what a worksheet might look like once you complete a report. The dark mode is what the report could look like when making graphical changes to the sheet. To highlight some changes, the background of the entire page is now black, the table now has white borders, the text has turned white, and the entire plot has changed, with the axis numbers and words and plot line all different colors. All of this can be done manually, of course, by using the Excel interface, but no one wants to do that every single time they need to change the visual properties of a sheet. We want all of that automated. So what I'm going to do in the following steps is turn this regular tab into the dark mode tab so that the sheets look identical side by side by the end. Here I bring in the workbook as WB and I select the worksheet as WS. Notice here that I am specifically making sure the worksheet named regular is the one that I am affecting. As I progress, I will be showing you what each block of code accomplishes, so each block will have a save method called to save our modified workbook as dark mode. There is one final thing to note before diving in. Let me save the workbook right now and show you something. I'll open up the workbook called dark mode and you can see the plot area background has become white again. It's supposed to be black, but for some reason, whenever I have been saving the workbook with the save method, it causes the plot area background to turn white. This actually won't affect our final product, and I'll show you guys how to work around this issue, but just something to be aware of as I'm walking through these steps and comparing tabs. So now, let's start transforming our workbook. To start out, let's fill the backgrounds of all of our cells with the color black. Each cell in Excel is considered an object in OpenPy Excel. That cell object has a fill attribute that accepts a pattern fill object, which has a property that defines what the background color should be. So I begin by importing the pattern fill object from the styles module of OpenPy Excel and create our fill black object right here. As parameters, I pass the start color argument, the hex code for black, which is just six zeros. I also specify the type of fill to be solid because I would like a solid black background for each cell. I'm going to skip the max row and max column variables for now and come back to them in a moment. Following those declarations, I have two for loops, one nested in the other. This format will be seen throughout this demonstration, so I'll go over it once right now. I start by looping through a range from one to the max row declared above, which is 100. Within that for loop, I'm iterating through each column within the range of one to the max column variable, which is 50 as seen above. Effectively, this ensures I'm capturing all cells within each row and column that I want to affect. In this second loop, I am accessing the cell method of the worksheet object. I pass row and column as the respective arguments to select the cell for the given loop of each for loop. Of that cell, I am assigning the fill attribute, the pattern fill object I created above called fill black. Let me execute this cell, which will also save the document, and see if we have a whole bunch of black cells now. And here we can see that we do. So far, we are successful. But let me pause here and scroll down and to the right. You will notice that the black only extends as far as the 100th row and the 50th column. 
Remember, that's how we had it in the variables declared in the notebook? Well, why not just color every single cell in the workbook? We don't want to do that because it would take an inordinate amount of time to accomplish, and it's just unnecessary and a waste of computational power. No one is going to be scrolling to the very last column and row for this report. If what we are currently viewing encapsulates the entire view of what we expect our users to see, all you need to do is color just enough so that it appears the entire thing has the same format. Given this report is small, I determine that I only need to color within the bounds that I declared in the notebook. Moving back to the Jupyter Notebook, let's focus now on changing all of the text to be white, so that we can actually read what is contained within the cells. Just as there is an object that contains the styling attribute for a cell background, there is one for fonts as well. So I will import that object from the styles module here. Next, I will create the font object by first creating a variable called color white, which contains six Fs, the hex string signifying white. I will assign that variable to the color argument of the font object, which you can see I am calling font white. The following for loop is a copy paste from the above with one exception. Instead of accessing the fill attribute of the cell, I want the font attribute. This attribute, I will assign my new font object, font white. Executing the cell, let's open the Excel workbook and see if we now have the white font. There we go. So far, we are making good progress. But before going back to Jupyter Lab, I want to point out what we'll be doing next. Notice the headers in the table between our two tabs? You'll see that the headers on regular are not bold, but those on dark mode are bold. What happened is that the font object we just created and applied to the document actually overwrote the bold attribute of this row. So let's go back and fix this. I'm going to create a font object and call it font white bold. This object will have two arguments passed. First is the one that we are familiar with, color equals color white. This is exactly the same as above. The second is new, the letter B. This is how OpenPy Excel determines whether the cell contents are or are not bold. By default, B is assigned false, so we just need to switch that to true in order for the font object to display the contents as bold. For this loop, I don't need to iterate through a range of rows. This is because I only want to change the font object for the first row. All I need is the column range for this one. Within the loop, you can see that I'm explicitly passing one as the row that I want to access and select the column variable as the column argument. I assign the cell's font attribute the new font object. Let me run this to save the workbook, and then I'll open it back up to see if it was successful. And there we go. Bold headers are now on our regular tab. The next piece I would like to tackle is the borders. As you can see here, they have disappeared. Well, technically they haven't disappeared. They are all just black, so we lost them when coloring in the background of all the cells. This is important to note because if we only want to border cells that used to have a border visible, we need to see if that cell is currently bordered. That's how we will accomplish this with the next block of code. In order to address our border issue, I need the border and side objects from the styles module, so I will begin by importing those with the first line of code. I want to start by making my side object which will be passed to some arguments of a border object. The side object represents what the border will look like on the cell. We want our side to have the thin style, which is the default border style of Excel, and we want its color to be white. This color argument accepts the hex code for a given color. I already have the white hex code saved in the color white variable, which I declared above, so I'm going to be passing that here. I now assign this side object to the locations of the cell 
we want them to be displayed on. This is done by passing those side objects the location arguments of a border object. You can see here I am assigning this border object's left, right, top, and bottom attributes, the white border side object I just created above. Now with my white border object created, we can go through the document and replace our black borders with white ones. We begin with our familiar four row and four column ranged loops. Within the inner for loop, I am saving the cell I want to affect as the variable cell, as you can see right here. I then access that variable's border attribute. This attribute accepts a border object as an assignment, which I am doing right here. You can see four different arguments being accessed, left, right, top, and bottom. Each of these arguments receives the exact same logic, which works in the following way. Assign this argument, the white border side variable, if the cell within this loop has a style on that specific border. I check to see if the side has a border by accessing the side in question and then accessing that attribute's style attribute. This check right here will return a true or a false. If it is true, the white border side object is applied to the given side. If it is false, the border argument, whether it be left, right, top, or bottom, will be assigned none. This will cause no border to be displayed on that cell. I'll run this and reopen the workbook to see if we can now see our borders. Yes, we can, and they are standing out nicely against the dark background. The next piece I would like to tackle is this conditional formatting. You can see these green cells here. They are a result of a conditional format check to highlight cells green if the cell's value is greater than 200. Opening up the conditional format wizard, you can see the rule right here. If the cell value is greater than 200, format the cell with a green background. I start this process by importing the objects I need related to conditional formatting. They are conditional formatting list from the formatting.formatting module and cell is rule from the formatting.rule module. Next, I need to eliminate the conditional formats that currently exist on the workbook. If I did not do this, I can still add the formatting rule I want to impose on the range of data, but it will not be displayed. The one that is already existing on the page will take priority. To eliminate all formatting on the sheet, I access the worksheet's conditional formatting attribute and assign it a blank conditional formatting list object. With that line, we have eliminated all conditional formats on the sheet. I next want to create a new pattern fill object with the color of my choice, which will be a darker green than is currently displaying on my regular sheet. I can use the same pattern fill imported object I used to fill in the backgrounds of each cell earlier in this video. I once again want a solid fill with this specific hex string as my dark green color. You may notice an additional argument here that was not in the other pattern fill object I created earlier, and color. This one is required for conditional formats, and I think it's because conditional formats do like to apply colors within a given range, so they are expecting a range of colors to be displayed. I'm not entirely sure if that's how it's working under the hood, but I know that if you use only start color, this will not work correctly. For our purposes, the color doesn't change, so we just keep the same color as the start and end of our color scheme. This final bit of logic adds the new conditional format to the sheet. You do this by accessing the add method of the conditional format attribute of the worksheet and passing it to arguments, the location and the format of choice. I will be assigning this conditional format to the range C2 through C13 and using the cell is rule object. To the cell is rule object, I pass three arguments, the operator, the formula, and the fill. The operator we care about for this example is greater than because we want all numbers greater than 200 to be assigned a new color. 
the formula is what the operator is compared against. This has to be a sequence of numbers, so it must be contained within a list. But we only care about anything greater than 200, so that's all I need to include here. Finally, the fill argument is the color we would like to assign all cells that meet the greater than 200 requirement. You can see I am assigning it the dark green pattern fill object created above. I'll run this cell and see if it worked. And there we go. The color is now the same on both sheets. The next piece of this process that I would like to tackle is a little bit complicated. It's the pivot table's top and bottom rows. They are a nice dark blue color, and I want to carry that over to our working sheet. Let's walk through that bit right now. I start by importing the column index from string function from the utils module of OpenPy Excel. I'm not immediately using it, so I'll talk about that a little bit later. The next step I take is to create another pattern fill object. This one is dark blue, which is contained as a hex string right here, and it will be a solid fill, just like the rest of the ones that I have created. Next, I do something new. I select the pivot table from the worksheet. Each worksheet has a underscore pivots attribute, which contains a list of all the pivot tables on the sheet. Since I only have one pivot table, I am able to select hours with the zero index and store the pivot table object in the pivot variable. I then need the location of this pivot table so I know what rows to appropriately color blue. I collect that location with the ref attribute of the location attribute that the pivot table object has. I store the location of the attribute in the pivot location variable. Executing the cell, we can see what the location looks like, a string of letters identifying the bounds of our pivot table. I now need to extract the start and end locations of the columns and rows of the table. I can simply pull apart this string to collect the information that I need. Pivot column start will be E, pivot column end will be F. Pivot row start is 2, and pivot row end is 6. I ensure I am capturing those row numbers as integers with that int function. Now I need to assign the dark blue color to the correct cells. I have the same type of nested for loop we've been working with so far, but the syntax needs to be slightly different for our purpose. I start off by only selecting the top and bottom row, as you can see here, with the list of two items, the first row as pivot row start, and the last row as pivot row end. Next, I go through the columns. Remember that column index from string function I imported above? Here is where we need to use it. In order for me to iterate through the columns I want to change, I have to cycle through the correct range. The range function only accepts numbers. So the way I address this need is passing the letters we return from our pivot table's location to the column index from string function. This function returns an integer identifying the column's location as a number. Here you can see I am using the function twice for the two range arguments. I add one to the second argument because the range function doesn't include the second number within the range. So I make sure I am capturing the last column that I need to change by adding one. Finally, the actual assignment of color is straightforward and is something we've seen before in this video. I access the fill attribute of the cell in question and assign it the pattern fill object that I created above. Time to execute this cell and check that we changed the color correctly. And here we can see our tables look identical on the two tabs with that nice dark blue color carried over. Everything related to our two tables is now complete. Time to address the chart. The chart changes are the most complicated part of the process. This is because we need to start playing with XML. XML is the underlying structure of all Excel documents, and it is what controls how things are displaying and how things are contained within the Excel document. 
Because charts can become so complicated, we are entering territory where we can't always just do a simple import of a needed object and assign an attribute that object. So let's switch back to Jupyter Labs and start this process. I would like to start with something pretty easy, changing the color of the line to yellow. Just like the underscore pivots attribute we just worked with, each worksheet has an underscore charts attribute that contains a list of all the charts on the worksheet. I can select our only chart with the zero index and I'll assign this the chart variable. Each chart that is displaying data in some format, whether it be a line, a bar, or a scatter plot, has at least one series associated with it. The series represents the data being displayed. So it contains information about the range of that specific data being displayed and the visual properties about the display, such as the line color. I will call our only series line. And just like in the line of code above it, I can select out the only series with the zero index. This series object captured in the line variable has a graphical properties attribute. It contains the visual properties that we can affect. Let me show you what this object looks like. This might look a little overwhelming. We are now working with the underlying XML of the document. And this is how OpenPy Excel communicates that information. But don't worry, each time we look into objects like this, we are only focusing on a single attribute or object. And we're working our way through those items of interest to find the attribute that we want to affect. We'll be diving deeper into this in a bit, but I wanted to give a preview of what's to come. But for now, we are only interested in the line's color itself. Looking at all of these attributes for the graphical properties, we can see that ln contains an object related to line properties. Let's work our way down to that one. This line properties object has only one argument that we need to concern ourselves with, solid fill. This object determines, among other things, the color of the line representing the series. To the solid fill attribute, we can pass either a color choice object, which you can see it currently is, or simply the color we want to display, as I have done above with the hex string representing yellow. Let me now uncomment the assignment line, execute the cell, and reopen the workbook to see if the line is now the appropriate color. and we can see we have successfully changed our orange line into a yellow one. Let's now change the background of our chart to be black so that it matches the color of the cells behind it. This requires us to bring in the graphical properties object from the charts.shapes module of OpenPy Excel. I create a new graphical properties object specifying the hex string for black as the fill color. I save this object into the charts properties variable. I then access the graphical properties attribute of the chart and assign it the object I just created. Essentially, we are just overwriting the graphical properties attribute with a new one of our own making. Let's run this cell and see if we were successful with our background color. Yes, we were. The background matches the color of the rest of the cells surrounding it. So that was another relatively easy one for us to accomplish, but here is where things start to get pretty complex. What I want to tackle next is the actual plot area's background. You can see changing the background of the chart itself didn't affect the plot area. So let's switch back over to our Jupyter Notebook. To accomplish this, I need to import two objects from the drawing.colors module of OpenPy Excel color choice and scheme color. These objects control the color features of an object and are required for the background of a plot area. Before diving into the following lines of code, let's take a peek at what we are working with. Here is the plot area object that contains all of the information regarding the plot of our graph. As you can see, it is quite extensive, and almost all of this we don't care about for our specific purpose right now. All we need to do is sift through this and find the piece that controls the background color of the plot area. 
So going back to our code block, I need to work backwards to explain why this specific segment of code is written in the specific way that it is. We are familiar with the graphical properties object because we just created one for the line color above. And actually, I've just noticed that I would like to change the name of this variable to background color instead of axis color. We'll be getting into the axis soon, and this block of code doesn't affect it. I don't want to confuse the variable names here. But continuing, here we are creating one with the solid fill of an object that I just made above. So nothing is new here. The next line up is the color choice object. This one is new, and you can see it's what I am assigning the solid fill attribute in the graphical properties object creation. This color scheme contains a scheme CLR attribute that represents the color selected. This schema attribute can only be passed a scheme color object. It will not accept anything else, such as a hex string representing a color. Our scheme color object is the first thing created in this block of code, and I call it color scheme white. It accepts many different arguments, all of them related to color, as you can see here, with some standing out, such as hue, saturation, red, green, and blue, illumination, and other color related subjects. The way that I was able to successfully obtain a black background is by turning the illumination all of the way off, which is accomplished with the loom mod and loom off attributes. I'm able to do this by assigning them both zero. You are also required to pass the val argument, and it only accepts a certain collection of strings as values. I honestly am not entirely sure what the val argument signifies or really what it does, but I have seen it in the XML and in the attributes of the OpenPyXL objects. I think TX1 is just a stand-in that Excel requires or accepts, so I'm going to pass that as a string, and it does allow everything to work as I expect it. So now let me uncomment this code, and let's assign our charts plot areas graphical properties attribute the black background that we just created. And yes, it worked. And you'll notice that this is the piece that OpenPy Excel itself was unable to retain when saving and reopening the workbook at the introduction of this video. Now we don't need to worry about that because we've assigned our own graphical properties object to the XML for our regular tab. So now let's take a look at changing the title color from this dark gray, which is hard to read on a black background, to the white of what will be its final form. Now this is where things start to get really fun. This is XML. It's what Excel actually looks like under the hood. OpenPyXL provides a way for us to add XML directly to a workbook, and I'll show how this works with the title color change. To start, there are some objects I'll need, rich text and from string, which can be found at the chart.txt and the xml.functions modules respectively. Rich text is not something found only in OpenPy Excel. It's a commonly understood means of communicating styles and formatting across different documents, OSs, and softwares of all kinds. We will need to use that tool to communicate our XML to our Excel document. I then explicitly declare the title I want to be displayed, which I want to remain trend over time. Now into the XML tree. XML is itself just a markup language that describes a document and provides structure to it. I won't go into too much detail on this in this video, but you can see an attribute within this string that we've already encountered, the solid fill attribute. The solid fill attribute contains another attribute called sRGBCLR which accepts a value as the color to be displayed. I believe it stands for string RGB color. Since we want a white title, I simply pass the val argument, the color white variable that we declared earlier on. 
there are several more tags here that, when you work your way through the code slowly, start to make sense and take a certain form in your mind. Right underneath the solid fill attribute is the argument type face with the apto narrow body value passed. This is how Excel declares the text font for your string of text. Right under that is the T object that has the title within its start and ending tag. T, I believe, simply stands for title or text. You keep working your way down the tree and you can see a P tab, which should be paragraph. And finally, the outer XML is TXPR, which stands for text properties. So ultimately, this entire block of code is simply a declaration of properties for the title text of my chart. To get this XML applied to my Excel document, I use the from tree method of the rich text object. To the from tree method, I need to send the function we imported called from string to properly present open PyXL with the XML that I have written above, as it is currently in a string format. This rich text object is assigned to the title.tx.rich attribute of the chart object. Instead of diving far into the XML of the title attribute, let's just assign the title tx rich attribute and save our work and reopen the document to check out what color our title is. Now we have our nice white title. But the axes are still a dark gray color, so let's focus on those now. The axes, numbers, and words will be using the scheme color and scheme choice objects that we imported earlier for our plot area's black background. I start by making a white scheme color object called color scheme white. This looks similar to our color scheme black object with one distinct difference. I have maxed out the loom off to 100,000. This is the opposite end of the spectrum from the black one where loom off was assigned zero. I next assign the scheme color to the color choice object just as I did with the plot area background code. I then fill in the solid fill attribute of the X and Y axes, but as you can see, it takes many steps to get there, as this attribute is really buried in the weeds. So let's pick this apart to find the color of these attributes. I'll use just the X axes because the code to change the Y axes is identical. Starting with the X axes attribute, you can see some things that might make sense. We have major tick mark, a max setting, which is likely for a maximum number on the X axis. And this over here is the tick label position, which places the labels next to your tick marks. What we actually need is the text properties attribute found at TXPR. You'll notice that this is actually a rich text object, just like the title that we made. You may also find that a majority of these attributes look like a foreign language. We have things like vertical overflow, T-I-N-S, R-I-N-S, compact line space, and forced double A, and just a ton of other attributes that are not immediately easy to understand. There is one thing, however, that stands out, P. We've seen this before when we were changing our chart title. We are dealing with the text of the rich text object after all, so let's start by selecting P. P contains a list of objects, and we want the first one. Just as before, you can see there are a ton of attributes to sift through. So let's just continue to look at what we need here. Properties. And here is where things can start to make sense when you know what to look for. Check out this def rpr attribute. Specifically, look at S, Z, B, I, U, strike, and solid fill. These are all attributes that control the graphical information about our axes. S, Z stands for size, B for bold, as we discussed earlier, I is for italicize, U is underline, strike puts a strike through the axes text, 
and solid fill, which we know is what colors the text. So we have finally arrived at the one little solid fill attribute we needed to walk all the way down just to find, just so that we could change the text color. So let's execute the cell and check out the work. And there we have it. Both of our axes are now colored white. We are nearly done. The last step is this border, and luckily it's probably the easiest part of the entire chart to change. All that is required is accessing the graphical properties attribute of the worksheet, specifying the line attribute and changing the solid fill attribute. Very simple. I have some code commented out above it. There is a no fill attribute that I believe is supposed to delete the border entirely, but it does not seem to work. Anytime I try to assign no fill to true, it would error out and break the workbook. No fill's default is false, so true seemed like the logical opposite to make it disappear, but I wasn't able to get that to work. So a good alternative is to just assign the border color the color of the cells behind it. Let's execute the cell and check it out. And look at that. We have successfully transformed our regular sheet to look identical to the dark mode we were aiming for, with only that one plot area background as an exception to the exercise. As I was able to demonstrate, when you break the entire process down into small, simple steps, you can accomplish it with any Excel workbook that you are working on. You just have to know when and where to apply the appropriate formatting. If you want to have a single script that you can run once you have your final Excel report ready, you can add all of the steps that I just demonstrated into a single .py file. In that .py file, you import your workbook, make all of the necessary changes you wish to be made, and save it. That single script should produce a final dark mode report, and with it you will have alleviated yourself of any more struggles dealing with the Excel interface each time you transform your workbook to your desired different appearance. Thank you for stopping by and checking out this video on how to construct a customized dark mode Excel report for yourself. If you found it helpful, please do give the video a thumbs up as it does help other folks find this content. Also, please do leave a comment below letting me know what you liked about the video. And let me know what other features of OpenPy Excel, Excel, or Python in general you would like to see reviewed in future videos. And please do hit that subscribe button so that you know when the next video drops.